Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, playing an online benefit for the beer-stained rock club that supported you for years, or else a scrappy upstart, playing an online benefit for the craft cocktail pop-up that supported you for months, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey guys, it's Friday, August 21st, and I thank you very much for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Jacques who drove a Nissan Cube with a tool bumper sticker and who tried to sell you pieces of ripped-up notebook paper that he claimed were acid tabs. And old Jacques would charge you about a 1000 bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. No more. That's not how it works anymore, you guys. We have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. Everything you need to build a professional website is already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, social media integrations, mailing list tools, the ability to crowdfund your next project commission-free. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, The Working Songwriter Podcast listeners can go to banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Just use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Um, If you'd like to hear some of my music in the coming months, here's where I'll be, 9 p.m. Eastern, every Sunday night, over on YouTube to play Sunday songs. Sunday songs is when I play a few songs of my own, when I play a few covers that I'd like to do, uh, when I... (laughs) When I recite a poem uh, for our Soft Boy Poem Corner segment, and most of all, where I take uh, requests from the chat that you guys are having live there, where I take questions from the chat that you guys are having live there, it's generally become a really fun and interactive experience. We're building a little bit of a community over there, including many members uh, uh, of the people of this audience here that listen to The Working Songwriter. A lot of people show up over there on Sunday nights. So Sunday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, over on YouTube. Just type in my name, Joe Pug, and uh, you should be good to go. Uh, Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, uh, here's a few things that you could do to help. First of all, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head over to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you don't have to pay, but that you choose to pay because you dig the show. Uh, If just 1% of our listenership would uh, kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make a huge difference. So thanks for all the people that have already taken the time to do that. Uh, If you're not in a financial position to kick in, I get it. I've been there before. Uh, You could still help us out for free, Uh, by leaving us a ratings in the iTunes store, or also just telling a friend about the show, spreading the word about the show. Uh, The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. I'll end all the harassment there. Uh, This man barely needs any introduction. He's a good friend of mine. Please welcome back to the show, Mr. Robert Ellis. My guest this week is Robert Ellis. Born in 1988, he grew up in Lake Jackson, Texas, just south of Houston. That's a town known for two things, the Dow Chemical Company and former Congressman Ron Paul. After dropping out of high school, he began playing in various bands and ensembles around the Houston area, playing everything from jazz to punk to country. 
His first self-released album, The Great Rearranger, caught the ear of George Fontaine Sr., one of the owners of New West Records. Robert's first release with New West, Photographs, was named one of the 50 best albums of 2011 by American Songwriter Magazine. The album ushered him onto the national stage where he's been ever since. From there, he and his band would cut their teeth touring, supporting the Drive-By Truckers, Old Crow Medicine Show, Deer Tick, The Old 97s, and Willie Nelson. For his ensuing album, Ellis wanted to expand his sound beyond the limits of the George Jones and Chris Christopherson mold that his initial efforts had cast him in. So he tapped renowned producer Jaquire King, whose past clients include Tom Waits, Modest Mouse, and Nora Jones. Their work together resulted in 2014's Lights from the Chemical Plant, a stylistically adventurous record that was received to great critical acclaim. He's appeared at Bonnaroo, Stagecoach, and the Austin City Limits Music Festival. He's appeared on NPR's Mountain Stage and also appeared as a guest on E-Town alongside Rodney Crowell. The New York Times described the Chemical Plant record as, quote, a gut punch of a third record of downcast roots music. An American songwriter has deemed him a singer at the very forefront of Americana's vanguard. I caught up with Robert on the phone a few weeks ago to hear what he's been up to since the last time we talked. So from where you're looking at, man, uh, do you do you think things are going to get back to normal? Like, what are you thinking right now? I mean, what is normal? I, I, I think a lot about this, um, you know, because I've got a family and, uh, I, I don't know. I was, um, on the drive up here, I was just thinking about like what a huge responsibility is, you know, when you have a kid, like you just, you think about things differently. Mm -hmm. Um, and you really, you have a lot to lose, um, financially, you know, like, uh, you just, things are in a different you're looking at it from a different perspective when you really are trying to think about keeping your kids fed and, and keeping them in a comfortable house and giving them a quality of life that you um, think is acceptable. Um, so anyway, all that to say, um, the risk is pretty huge. And so I'm making a lot of moves right now to kind of pivot and figure out what I'm going to do. And realistically, when I really put everything down on paper, I just don't see it returning. You know, I don't see touring being a huge part of my, revenue in the way that it was. I would say that for a very long time, it's been about 95% of my revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and one, I, I think that with all of this stuff going on, like I just can't envision a scenario where venues are at half capacity and people were, are wearing masks. And I am on the short list of bands that are trying to get holds for that venue and successfully doing it. You know, like it just, it just seems like if, if there is music, I am, from a competitive standpoint, not going to be able to participate in it. You know, every fucking band in the world is going to be out there trying to tour in the fall if they allow that to happen. And I, I just think it's going to be extremely difficult for us to compete um, in, in that kind of market. Um, My pitch to the so clubs no, I, would be this. I would say, listen, these clubs are already half full when I play them anyway, so nothing will feel different. <laughs> <laughs> nothing will feel different for no. people. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will change. But I do want to say um, things returning back to normal is uh, its not necessarily what I want either. So, you know, I'm at a point in my life where, like, before any of this happened, I was already feeling like this is a bit unsustainable. The only way to make money is to leave my family and to go, you know, slog it out around the world. Uh, and I love playing music for people, but it is it's pretty um, prohibitive when it comes to writing music, I find, and when it comes to uh, just maintaining general mental health. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just I did it for a long time, and I'm really excited about pivoting into something else. Yeah, uh, I think in general, the touring, you know, basically year-round and, you know, album cycles butting up to, to, um, to one another, butt to butt, um, that is the game for young men and young women ages, you know, 18 to, to 33 to 35, you know what I mean? And then after that, um, you got to be much more selective 
um, about it. But the good part about it is if you do that through your 20s, it's the only way to get really good is to play in clubs every night for 10 years. That's the only way to get good. It definitely helps. I mean, there's no replacement for real world experience, but I do think a lot about time management, um, you know, and, and I think that on the road, realistically, I'm playing music for about an hour to two hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I'm lucky, maybe I have some time in the green room to like warm up once we get there. Um, but I, I do think if you're home and you're focused, you can, you can really get good yeah. <laughs> by, by practicing, you know, it's like you have to be self-motivated to do that, but I'm, I'm just loving this time, you know, I'm spending really focused energy and time, not only on writing, but on, um, you know, like hearing a recording and being like, Oh my God, I've always wanted to learn to play that. And then ordering the book on Amazon and learning some Bill Evans transcription or something like that's just stuff that I don't normally have the time to do. Uh, and even, even with a kid, uh, and no childcare right now, I'm finding, finding time to do it. I remember one time you said to me on the phone, you were like, Robert, having a kid is so easy. <laughs> and the, the, <laughs> point you, the point you were making is you were like, he goes to sleep at seven o'clock. He's like, he's out at seven and I've got all the time in the world. I think we were talking at like yeah. 11 PM, sure. you know, <laughs> and you're like, I can't even fill all the spare time that I have. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I still, if your situation is set up right, I still do believe that because, well, that's assuming that like, you're just all in on raising the kid, you know what I mean? And your priority is there. You don't want to be somewhere else. And if you don't want to be somewhere else, I think it is in some ways easy to raise a kid. You know what I found myself doing recently? I've been watching both my kids in the morning while my wife works. She's a school teacher. So she's teaching kids uh, remotely from nine to one and I've got the kids and, um, I find myself just walking with them and instead of, you know, being a bohemian in a coffee shop with my checkered notebook, uh, writing stuff, I've just been writing songs in my head now. Like that's my new deal. That is, I I tell this to my students all the time. Like I read this book, um, I think Courtney Hartman gave it to me, um, that was written by this chess player, um, who, I mean, the kind of the whole point of the book just uh, to summarize is that he says that he won all of these chess tournaments by instead of physically playing the game, just constantly visualizing it. So he's like, when you're doing the dishes, you know, when you're walking the dog, like if you can in your head be playing chess and imagining not only your moves, but your opponent's moves. um, And he sort of applied it to all creative pursuits. And I do it all the time. I mean, not only with writing, but you know, if, if you're thinking about, Soloing. I mean, my favorite jazz soloists are really lyrical, like Chet Baker's a great example. Um, and I just started when I'm on a run or when I'm on a bike, um, thinking of a tune and singing improvised solos to it. And you would just be blown away at how much more progress I make when I sit down at the guitar, mm-hmm. having done that. Like, if, if that stuff's in your head, then it comes out in your playing. Are you, there? you got me? Yeah, sorry. Are you there? No, was that was that an awkward pause? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't cut out. I just I stopped the thought. <laughs> um, what I was talking about, I'm not talking about that anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I do that not just with songwriting now, but I also do it like so. I'm trying to put together. Um, I think I've talked to you about this a little bit, but. I'm trying to put together a YouTube show with a much better production value than I'm doing right now. I'm kind of, I'm working on version 2.0 right now. And so I'm learning like a lot of technical stuff. And I find that I'll be working and researching stuff and I'll, I'll, I'll reach a point where I can't, I can't visualize any further. And then I'll go do the dishes or I'll go for a jog or I'll just be in the backyard squirting the kids with a hose. And that is when I just start taking around like, okay, well, if I put the, the microphone in through the camera, then that solves this problem. And um, yep. it's something about having kids and watching them. You, you just have all this time. It's so much hurry up and wait. You know what I mean? Like you just have all this time mm-hmm. where you just need to be there to make sure that they don't put a fork in their eye, that you do have time yep. to use mental energy to, to, I don't know, run experiments in your brain almost. And when you do that stuff, like go do the dishes, you're letting your subconscious do some of the heavy lifting. Like I find that really focused, 
conscious attention on something is often less effective than taking a breath and just letting my brain do some of that work. You know, it's the whole Malcolm Gladwell thing. But um, but yeah, having a kid certainly puts it in perspective. Like I, I, I hate to get frustrated um, or not believe people, but often when I'm teaching, people will say something to the effect of, um, oh, I just don't have much time to practice. And I'm like, neither do I. Right. You know, fine. You know, if you can find 10 minutes and make it focused and make it effective, I think that's enough. And I'm constantly just stealing moments throughout the day to do that stuff. Uh, and, you know, especially when they get to a certain age, I sit with, um, sorry, I think we're getting a package. What are you looking for? Um, it's not this one. I think it's the next house. You're saying it's behind. It's not. Yeah. Here. Might be. Sorry, this is 2304, so maybe it's on the other side of the street? Oh, my God. This, Joe, this shit drives me absolutely fucking insane. I am, I mean, I know, you know I'm paranoid, but, like, why do you need to get closer than six feet to me? You're delivering a package, just be six feet apart. You know, like, it's, there's no reason we need to be close. We can hear each other. It just, it is maddening. And you're not wearing a fucking mask. These people don't believe that this is serious. You know, I just, it's, it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what more information they need uh, to understand that it's serious. But, um, but. Well, yeah. where were we? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm out of my front yard pacing because that's the only way I can talk on the phone. And um, the Amazon delivery guy just had the wrong address. Uh, and was wandering in, into my backyard. <laughs> no, you're good. You, you, you were just saying, you were speaking to how people kind of complain, like, well, I don't have any time to practice. And your point is, well, oh. like, yeah, nobody has any time, man. Yeah, you have to prioritize and steal away time that you can um, and really be uh, adamant about making the time that you do spend useful. Like, I, I just, yeah, I can't waste time. You know, it's just like, if you've got 10 minutes, it has to be working towards your goal in some way. Um, and I've thought a lot about this for music business too. And I think me and you have talked about this is like, I want everything I do to support everything else I do uh, in this sort of holistic way. And it's taken me a long time to get to this point of thinking about it like this, but you know, with your podcast and your music and your YouTube channel, all of these things, they're not, isolated you know they don't yeah. exist in a vacuum they they help each other and they sort of tell a larger story about your who you are and what you create you know um yeah. and i just i'm trying to think about things in that context um and yeah for a while touring was a part of that but trying to imagine a future where it's not really uh it's just like how do i maximize all of the things i do to benefit the other things I do. Yeah, I you think know? the thing that, that's really changed in the last 10 years is, you know, about 10 years ago, I finally, I realized and I decided, I was like, oh, cool. The New York Times is not going to write about me. You know what I mean? Or, you know, yeah. name your cool uh, publication. They're not going to write about me. Bummer. Okay. Uh, but the interesting th thing that's happened in the last 10 years is it's, okay, the New York Times uh, is not going to write about me. Pitchfork isn't going to write about me. The new thing is that doesn't matter. Like, no. I think 10 years ago, if you were, if the New York Times were to write a certain thing about you or Pitchfork were to give you a certain score, I think that that would have made a difference in how many asses you put in chairs at a show. And now I think yeah. that the New York Times could come out tomorrow and say that Joe's latest album is the best thing since sliced bread and, you know, go listen to it. I genuinely don't think that it would make that big of a difference uh as to how many people actually came to shows. I just don't. I don't either. Uh, at, you know, it's, it's sort of ironic. Um, at the same time that our industry was crumbling, I think theirs was losing power in the same sort of way. You know, they're, they're sort of parallel, and, um, and you see it in all creative pursuits. But uh, in a similar way that we got hoodwinked into giving our music away for free, you know, for a long time now, all of the content we consume is created by publications. Those publications host their content on Facebook, and the ad revenue that they used to get for hosting their own content now goes to Facebook, and all of these people can't figure out how to make money on journalism. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, like, it's not, um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I do think you're right. Our metrics are off for what success is and for what will lead to success. Uh, and I've been trying to reframe that uh, out of necessity, I guess. But also, I'm just, I've spent 10 years of fucking beating my head against a wall. Yes. You know, I put out four records on this record label and I just feel like for 10 years I've been just like holding my breath and waiting for something good to happen. Right. Um, you yeah. know, and I'm just sick of it. I, I don't believe it anymore. Um, and I don't want to spend my time and energy chasing a moving target anymore. You know, I, I think that if we've been doing it the wrong way, we need to adjust and we need to set new goals and, and try to focus on things that we can actually attain. And who knows, maybe we're wrong, but I definitely can't keep doing what I was doing. You know, exactly. That's where I was in 2015. We put out an album called windfall and I was still with a record company at that time. And we did it in a really traditional way with a really traditional publicist, the same sort of rollout, yada, yada, yada. And it didn't work at all. We just maintained, you know, you know, basically the same listenership that we've always had, which is very much appreciated, but you know, you always hope to, to grow it. And uh, after I was like, after we'd done that, I'm like, all right, well, I gave you the album that you asked for. I did everything that you asked touring wise, everything that you asked publicity wise, and we're still in the same place. So I'm not doing this anymore. It's not working. So I I'm, I'm just doing a new thing. And, that, and that's when I started the podcast and that's when I started, uh, you know, getting ready to put out my records myself. Um, cause I was like, man, I can go to a bank and get a loan. I, I don't need to go and get a loan that cost me 50% of the revenue of this album for the rest of its life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like subprime is, uh, doesn't even begin. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, in fairness, I had a really good relationship with Logan and, and lightning rod records and, and, and they were as fair as a record deal would be. I had just gotten to a point where it was like, all right, well, I see what you guys are doing and I think I can front the money for that or I can, I can borrow it myself and uh, let's just go from there. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't, similarly, I don't want to bad mouth anybody and I definitely don't want to claim that I have all the answers um, because we could very well try this. And as we've probably both seen with many friends and artists, we know you know, it's equally likely that we could just vanish into obscurity. I, I often think about like, oh, so-and-so is releasing their own records now. See you later. I'll yep. just never hear about them, you know, and that does happen. Totally. Um, but I don't know. We've been fortunate, I think. You know, like all of the things we've done have definitely gotten our foot in the door enough that um, it's it's kind of open now. You know, it's it's at least cracked, and I don't... I'm not too stressed. You know, I have a good fan base and I do believe that if I need to, I can just live with the fan base I have and figure out how to maximize, you know, how to make a living off of what I have um, rather than constantly chasing this, this bigger future thing. Um, and primarily, you know, the biggest thing about this is the art suffers, you know, like mm. the way that I was doing things before I made so many compromises and so many sacrifices because I had people telling me, look, if you just do this, if you just do this, you know, and it's yeah. just like I wasted so much time and energy and it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> had it worked, I'd be like, you know what? It was completely worth it. You know, mm -hmm. like leading with that single that you guys thought was correct, even though I knew another song was the single, I, I was wrong and uh, now I'm rich and famous. <laughs> <laughs> But it just never, it never turned out that way. So I just, I kind of have no choice but to not, I, ca I can't in good conscience believe it, you know? Yeah. Because um, if I believe it, then that means everything is broken. You know, <laughs> that means the whole thing is broken. And if that's the case, then I just need to stop altogether. <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, after, or, uh, after Windfall oh, came oh, out and I kind of hit the point that you're at, I, I did get to a point where I was like, you know what? Because I had the whole winter off. I wasn't going to do anything. And I, I found out that my wife was pregnant. And I was like, let me let me see what this is like. And I went back for about a month. I had a buddy who had a construction company in Austin. And for about a month, I went back and I sided houses for a month. Not because I needed the money right then, but just because I wanted to see like, well, if I had to leave music, uh, could I go back to being on a job site again? And I went and I sided houses for a month. And I was just like, Nah, fuck this, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hate it. Yeah. The shittiest gig uh, on the face of the planet is still better. 
uh, than having to work for somebody. I mean, look, building houses is good, honest work, but having to go work for somebody else for, you know, let's say I wasn't very skilled, so I'm making 12 to 15 bucks an hour. Look, man, yeah. you know, playing the crappy gig in Augusta, Georgia, uh, is much better than, uh, than that. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's, um, you know, we, I think we do what we do because we believe that it's good, like actually good. It's good for the world. And we want to, you know, share who we are with people and, you know, make everyone a little bit less lonely. I think that's what music is for. It's what it is for me when I listen to it. And so I do have some sort of like hippie bullshit, um, you know, ethics and morals about why I do this and what I want to get out of it. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I don't know that I could ever be one of these guys that gets a straight job, you know, and just goes back to doing something. But I definitely, I definitely can try and figure out, you know, it's just, I look around and there's, there's money being made in music. Yeah. It's just not me that's making it, <laughs> you know, like, and so it's just like, I must be doing something wrong. I, I, again, what I was saying about, um, doing it uh, the way they wanted to for so long. If their way is correct and I didn't succeed, then that means something about me is wrong. Something I'm doing is not correct. The music's not right. Or maybe I don't look right. Or maybe my personality isn't um, something that people want, you know? And I just don't believe that. I don't think that's... I don't want to feel that way. You heard Robert speaking to the eternal divide there is between creators and the people whose job it is to get the creator's work into the hands of other people who could love it. In music, it's managers, publicists, labels. In movies, I suppose it's studios and producers. In the poetry and fiction worlds, it's literary agents. There's an inherent tension between those two camps. Charles Bukowski gave a wry and blue take on that tension in his poem, I am visited by an editor and a poet. I had just won $115 from the head shakers and was naked upon my bed, listening to an opera by one of the Italians, and had just gotten rid of a very loose lady when there was a knock upon the wood. And since the cops had just raided a month or so ago, I screamed out rather on edge, Who the hell is it? What do you want, man? I'm your publisher, somebody screamed back, and I hollered, I don't have a publisher. Try the place next door. And he screamed back, You're Charles Bukowski, aren't you? And I got up, peeked through the iron grill to make sure it wasn't a cop, and I placed a robe upon my nakedness, kicked a beer can out of the way, and bade them enter, an editor and a poet. Only one would drink a beer, the editor, so I drank two for the poet and one for myself. And they sat there sweating and watching me, and I sat there trying to explain that I wasn't really a poet in the ordinary sense. I told them about the stockyards and the slaughterhouse and the racetracks and the conditions of some of our jails. And the editor suddenly pulled five magazines out of a portfolio and tossed them in between the beer cans. And we talked about Flowers of Evil, Rimbo, Villan, and what some of the modern poets looked like. J.B. May and Wolf the Headley are very immaculate, clean fingernails, etc. I apologized for the beer cans, my beard, and everything on the floor, and pretty soon everybody was yawning, and the editor suddenly stood up and I said, are you leaving? And then the editor and the poet were walking out the door, and then I thought, well, hell, they might not have liked what they saw, but I'm not selling beer cans and Italian opera and torn stockings under the bed and dirty fingernails. I'm selling rhyme and life and lime. And I walked over and I cracked a new can of beer and I looked at the five magazines with my name on the cover and wondered what it meant. Wondered if we are writing poetry or all huddling in one big tent clasping assholes. We're going to see a big winnowing here in the next 18 months. I don't think anyone's going back to touring for at least 18 months. 
Um, and then when, I don't either. when we do come back, um, the amount of clubs that have survived will be in the neighborhood of five to 10%. You know, your 930 okay. clubs will survive, knock on wood. Your first avenues will survive, knock on wood. But other than that, I don't know who's safe. And um, so it's going to look like a very different landscape when we get to the other side of this. Um, and I'm just well, trying to hold on so that I can be one of the people that's here on the other side of it. Well, think about it this way. I mean, the both for venues and for musicians, I see, I foresee like a um, just death of the middle class happening. I think those heritage acts that you mentioned, like the 930 Club, they'll survive in the same way Wilco will survive. When yep. this thing is over, we'll all go see Wilco again. Right. Um, and, you know, I think scrappy 21-year-old musicians will always get in bands and go play house shows. Yes. And I don't see that going away. It's it's the middle class. It's, it's those of us who are, um, you know, working. This is another thing that this has all been really illuminating to me. Um, somebody posted a thing about, you know, how Spotify is doing this donation link thing. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's great. That's awesome. It's the bare minimum that they could do. I really appreciate them sure. finally ponying up and doing the bare minimum. But it also is offensive that the fans are the ones who have to pay more. You know, like, you guys now need to help these musicians. And I just, I posted something the other day about, like, look, all of this outreach and this aid is awesome. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of labels and, you know, sort of like music infrastructure come out and really try and help musicians. And I just, I'd like put some comment, like the reason that we're all struggling is because we, this was unsustainable and we were in a compromised position to begin with. You know, the reason that we don't have any money right now is because we were all just hanging by a thread before. Uh, yeah, and I, I I don't know. I think I have a little bit of a different view of Spotify than, than you do. I, I, I just don't see what the other option besides Spotify was. Like we went through basically a Gutenberg revolution with how music is consumed digitally. And so how do you monetize that? And I mean, don't forget, like there was a period between 2005 and 2015 when Spotify really finally got to scale where there was just no money coming in. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know I mean? And you're right. You're right. It is a legitimate revenue stream when there wasn't one before. Right. But I do think that there are insidious forces working behind the scenes to strong arm these companies into just maintaining the status quo. I mean, for a time, I don't know if you remember this, but there were articles about it. And I heard whispers of like Spotify was all about creating this um, back end infrastructure where independent musicians could upload their own music to Spotify. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't know if you saw, but a handful of months ago that got shut down and I can, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I can only speculate that all of the labels and everyone in the industry that that, uh, could have hurt, banded together and said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't want artists uploading directly to the platform. <laughs> you sure. know, like, they, they still need us. Um, and I just feel like it's all so entrenched and so um, incestuous that you're right, there's revenue coming from it, but I don't think we're participating as much as we should in that revenue um, as the creators of the content. You, you know? know, but that means uh, you have to... So it's been interesting. So this is the first time around that I funded something by myself. So I took out a loan for a bank, paid for the record, and then the record came out. We we took care of a lot of that with like the, the opening sales. But then, you know, I still had this loan to pay off. And uh, but what's interesting is so like, three months after the record came out, I'm like, Oh, my God, I'm screwed. Like, the numbers aren't adding up here. But now, I'm almost a year into how long the album's been out and the revenue's still coming in, unlike a record advance, which you get once and you never get again. Yep. And I'm seeing yep. like, oh, over the long term, if I play my cards right, this money just continues to, to drip, 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 drip in. And if I'm smart with my money, like th that's how it comes in at that point rather than in yeah. one lump sum. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. And, you know, are there forces trying to shut down people from uploading it? Yeah, maybe, but you can always go get a TuneCore account or a CD Baby account, and they'll, you know, I don't think, I don't think CD Baby has a, a secret layer in at the center of the earth. Okay. <laughs> you don't, you don't think there's a CD Baby cabal? Uh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no, ways I, I to get it up that aren't through Atlantic Records or Domino Records or something. Yeah. you know, I I completely agree with you, and um, and yes, I'm not I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth, but I also, you know 
doing the numbers that you just talked about with your record, mm -hmm. if I think about the physical, you know, like the making of 500 vinyl or 1,000 vinyl or whatever, and just the economics of that, if I break it down, the amount of money that I'll net at the end of the day is nowhere near enough money for the eight months of work that it takes to make the record. Right. And so that streaming revenue is really helpful in, you know, increasing your, like, PRO and getting mailbox money from songs that you have out is it's kind of the only way to do it. I guess I'm a little jaded because I've been in a situation for so long where I've just never seen that happen. You yeah, know, well, I, well, and I think what you just said is exactly right, which is, it, to make a traditional album that you write, record, master, manufacture, and publicize, that is an eight-month, very expensive process. And I think what we're just starting to learn is, okay, well, that's not, right now, that's just not justified by the numbers in the middle class right now. So how do you, you know, how do you make art that doesn't cost that much? Uh, you know, how does that happen? Uh, you know, the first thing that I'm really going to look at big time line item wise is how much I pay a publicist, you know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's the most, for people that aren't in the business that are listening, um, I, I would venture to guess that it is similar everywhere, but specifically music publicity, it's like, there's just no accountability, you know, like as with many parts of the music business, you pay someone money and then you say, okay, what, what are you working on? And they say, oh, that's not really how it works. We can't really share with you what we're working on. You'll just hopefully get famous because you paid me the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and it's, it can be infuriating. Um, and not to mention, you know, like the whole thing, I really do feel like a lot of it is meant to destroy your confidence <laughs> and to make you feel, you know, not worthy or, um, to make you feel like if things don't go right, it was your fault all along. Sure. And as long as you did the right things, you, you gave it the college try, you know, as long as you paid the right person. And, um, and yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I, when I explain this, this stuff to like friends or family members who are in other businesses, uh, and have been successful, uh, mm -hmm. people that, that, that just think about business. I, when I explain this stuff to them, often I get a resounding, what the fuck are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and they're right. But I just think we're so used to it. You know, it's like... Yeah, there's a couple things in, in the music business that are just there that have never made... Like one thing that I've never done, they told me early on, they were like, well, a lot of people get a business manager. And I'm like, okay, you know, well, how much does that cost a year? You know, a couple thousand bucks per year. And they were like, no, it's 5%. And I'm like, wait, the business manager gets... 5% of my net. And they were like, no, 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 no. He gets 5% of your gross. gross. <laughs> like what? <laughs> I'm not paying someone a percentage to run fucking QuickBooks for me, man. I'm just not doing it. Yeah. And I you know, there's a lot of legacy stuff like that, that I've, that I still participate with. But, but you know, that was one that just from the outset, I'm like, that makes no sense. You know, it's funny. I have a business manager and he is great. And I <laughs> happily pay him the money that I pay him. I think I'm just not, I mean, like, even just running a, a monthly profit and loss statement, I'm like, it's worth whatever because it's so uh, maddening and um, usually it's, it's pretty like uh, demoralizing for me to do. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I really like my business manager, but, um, but no, I know what you mean. I mean, the percentage basis thing, it's all this idea that um, the work we do is building this company and so at the end of the work we do we want to participate as a partner in this company from a percentage basis uh and there's just it removes transactional accountability you know what i mean like when yeah, you go you know, through if i had a bigger business so if i was doing it in amount of revenue with my business where it's like, hey, Joe, we got a couple tens of thousands of dollars that you don't need for your owner's equity and that, that band members don't need a salary. Uh, I'm going to find out a good place to invest this. Okay, let's talk about you. Uh, but, you know, for me, for me, it's more of like I'm going to put the numbers into QuickBooks and then cut the band uh, some checks and mail them. So it just doesn't yeah. make sense in that case. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. What are you working on right now, man? Are you working on a new record? Are you just are you are you uh, doing studio sessions up in Fort Worth? What are you doing? Man, I have just just since quarantine started. So at the beginning of March, I guess, um, you know, South by Southwest, I was planning on doing a whole lot, and um, 
everything got canceled and it was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Robert. Oh shit. Right before they announced the official quarantine. And so since then, I haven't really left the house at all and I'm extremely paranoid and I don't even go to the grocery store. I get everything delivered. Um, but I, since then, so I guess it's been two months, I have written 13 songs that I think are good and then a handful of others that aren't that great. Um, but I, I think I'm going to record a record like in the next couple weeks. How maybe are you going to do by that? The end. Well, so Josh, um, who I work with in Fort Worth, Josh, Josh Block, he moved um, a lot of his gear from his studio to his house. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'm just, he's, um, he's also very paranoid and has seen no one. And I think it would be safe for the two of us to quarantine together and to make this record. So, um, <laughs> Oh, so you wouldn't need any I, other musicians to do, or you could have people fly the tracks in or something like that. I, I think I'm just going to do it solo. It's um, all guitar driven and it's all, um, you know, guitar and voice. And I, I've always wanted to make a record that was, um, sort of like, I guess, English folk inspired, you know, I love Richard Thompson and I really love this like Andy Irvine, Paul Brady record. Um, and then more modern things like Adrian Linker's solo record, you know, a big thief, mm -hmm. um, just like solo acoustic and voice is something that I really, I listen to a lot and I don't know why I've never done it. And, um, it, this just seems like a good time, you know, it kind of, kind of back to the business conversation we were having is like, what can I do with what I have right now? You know, right. that's sort of all, all I think about is like, how can I maximize what I've got right in front of me? And right now that's a guitar and a voice. And, um, and yeah, I've always wanted to do this anyway. So it just seems like a good time. That sounds perfect, man. Well, I'm glad we finally caught up, dude. <laughs> this conversation. Yeah, I'm, people are going to be like, wow, that was a bitch fest. Those guys just railed against the music business for half an hour. I know, I've never really had a... Uh, <laughs> this, uh, what's really funny is over this um, over this quarantine, the podcasts have gotten closer and closer. I'd say that there's about a half a dozen people that I'll call after I've had three beers at about 9 p.m. Uh, at night, and I'll just start fucking talking, and you're one of them, and... Uh, this is uh, closer to one of those calls than it, than it was a podcast, to be completely honest. <laughs> well, I hope people enjoyed it and take everything with a grain of salt. You know, um, I yeah. think our feelings are probably changing day to day as we navigate this new landscape. Um, so, totally. Totally. Yeah. All right, brother. Well, love to you and the fam, and I hope you guys stay you safe. Too, man. Well, I love you, Joe. Thanks so much. Love you too, um, man. And I hope, I hope this is listenable, and uh, yeah, let me know. I'll it is, definitely, and I'll, uh, I'll okay. talk to you soon, man. Okay, peace. All right, bye. That's our show for this week. It was brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Robert's latest album is entitled Texas Piano Man, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember... An expensive drug habit is not a song. A compelling Instagram account is not a song. And most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>